Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Josh. Um, so today we have the opportunity to finish our series in First Thessalonians. Uh, if you are visiting, we have been in a series since the start of the new year, uh, walking through this New Testament epistle that Paul has written to a church plant, a church that is young, that has been started uh, in a place where there was no other churches. This is the first in that area. And, and we've been walking through this, praying and hoping that as we do so in our community groups and here on Sunday mornings, that God would begin to stir in us some things as a church that we might be able to replicate and look like and reflect him as he has planted and called us here in this neighborhood of Lake Highlands and beyond the city of Dallas and the world. And so this morning, uh, if you caught that, this is a lot of uh, verses here kind of wrapping up our series, but we're really going to hone in on a, a couple of verses. And I don't know if you caught this or not. Uh, there is a part of that passage that says, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I'm not a scholar by any means, but I would say if you come across a phrase like that in the Bible, it might be a very important scripture to know. The good news, too, is it, it's actually really short verses. And, and the three things he gives us that precede that statement of this is God's will for your life are very, very, very important. For anybody in here this morning that would say, I am a follower of Jesus. And so I, I want to unpack that. I want to look at that and how we might be able to live into that individually and as a church. But before doing so, uh, a, a couple years before COVID, I remember, it kind of feels like how you mark life now is pre-COVID, post-COVID. Um, but a couple years before COVID, I remember listening to this guy who was a comedian. He was on a late night talk show and he was kind of doing this bit that I'm sure he's done in, in stand-up routines before. But he, he started by telling, I think it was Jimmy Kimmel, he said, everything right now is amazing. Everything right now is amazing and nobody is happy. And, and people begin to chuckle and then he, he tees it up and he says, I mean, think about it. The way that we talk about traveling in a plane, often for many of us, we talk about it as if it's this horror story. That we show up to the airport, our flight might be delayed by 15, 20, 30 minutes. We're having to wait. What an inconvenience. The, the whole shuffle onto the plane is kind of, you know, too much close proximity to a lot of strangers. It's just all a hassle. You get on the plane. You sit on the plane. You might have to be forced to wait on the tarmac for a while. How could they do such a thing to you? And he's playing this all up, and he says, okay, well, then what happened? Did you take part in the miracle of human flight? Were you then sitting in a chair in the middle of the sky flying to a different place in, a minute, in minutes to an hour? And he goes on to talk about it in the same way with cell phones and technology. Again, we're, we're all quick to do this. But something we didn't know existed a few years ago now owes us what we need in that instance. And if it doesn't, we get frustrated with that app or that phone or whatever it might be. And again, not considering and thinking about what is taking place and how unbelievably the technolog te technological advancements and educational advancements and the vast majority of things that are available to people around the world that were not years ago. He said, everything is amazing, but nobody's happy. And, and I, I preface with that to say this, and, and you can look in, at your own life and the life of people that you know around you, but I think we all know that good circumstances in life do not equal contentment or joy or satisfaction. It's not a complete parallel. That often we can have a lot of things going the way that we would even imagine they would have gone. And yet there seems to at times still be this unsettling, this dissatisfaction, this longing as if this didn't do what it was supposed to do. And what's really, really wild as you read the New Testament and as you read somebody like Paul is that he actually flips it on his head and says that, Everything in your life circumstantially could be bad. And yet there is a joy and there is a life and there is a satisfaction that can be found that is as solid as it gets. And, and it's a wild thing to think about. And I, I, I preface with that this morning because we're in a, a passage and we're really going to hone in on these scriptures where, as I mentioned, he says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And it's three things. I don't know if you saw this, Sam, if you can pull the scripture up again, starting in verse 16. It 
somewhere up here. Next one, but he says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. It's a different verse. All good. I'll tell it to you. It's real quick. <laughs> Second Thessalonians, I mean, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Always and in every circumstance. What a call. How do we do that? And so I, I want to walk through this together kind of just one by one. But the first thing we can't miss, that if we're going to do this, and this is often how Paul writes his epistles, but if you notice, the beginning half of books is always maybe real doctrinal, real theological. He's getting at the heart of the matter. What you might call justification. The way that you are looked at by God, you're standing before him. He wants to make sure that that first is right before he gets into what would be called orthopraxy or your living or your doing. And so as we get into these verses, it's, it's worth saying because sometimes we can read the doing and think we've got to go do these things when some of us actually are doing that from a wrong place and we have, we have left the first part behind. It's why, it's why he says this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. That all of this begins and ends if you are a person who has looked to Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I want to read this quote. Some of you may know who John Stott is, but I love this. Because sometimes, again, the faith, our faith can kind of, a lot of things can come up to mind of what it means to be a Christian. I love the simplicity and the solidness of this answer. He says, Christianity is, just, is not just an intellectual system, a theology or a philosophy or a creed or a moral code or belonging to a church by undergoing baptism or participating in worship or communion. The core of Christianity is Christ. A Christian is someone who personally and decisively is committed to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I think it's important to, to draw us back here. It's why we say we want to be a Jesus-centered church. It's not because we've come up with something new. This is what the church has done for thousands of years. But we are people quick to move on to what's next. We've got to be in Jesus Christ. What a Christian is is someone who's devoted to the person of Jesus Christ. That they love him and they long to want to love him and know him more because they know who he is and they know the price that he has paid for their sins. Getting this and understanding the way that God looks at us through and in Jesus as spotless righteousness, as Charles prayed this morning, that begins to well up in you the action to actually work out your salvation, like Paul will say in a different passage. Not to work for, but to work it out. And so Paul is encouraging and exhorting this church who has made a real difference in Thessalonica and who longs for the churches following their footsteps to also make a difference. So in Christ Jesus, just the part I wanted to make sure we didn't skip that first. But now if we're to look and live into this call, the will of your life, I, I want to look at these three things. The first being rejoice always. Again, maybe God in his providence, maybe Paul didn't know that something like COVID was going to hit. Seriously, rejoice always when, when, when sickness, when diagnosis that you didn't expect come, when there's real pain and heartache and hardship like we learned this morning, it's in that place too that there's this call to be somebody that can find gladness and joy. And I think it's helpful to, to remember also that Paul is not somebody sitting in this ivory tower telling them to do this, that Paul lived it to the core. But again, if, if you know who he, who he was in his life, I mean, this man was shipwrecked and beaten numerous times, in prison, left for dead, no place to lay his head, family left behind him. This man lost everything for the sake of Jesus. And it's this man that said, I have found this way to be someone who can rejoice always, and I charge you to do the same. But the question is how? How did he do this? And as Samuel pulled up, I do want to pull up this parallel passage. Some of you are familiar with this passage in Philippians 4. It's a pretty well-known passage. And, and there's a lot of similarities here to this call that he gives to the Thessalonians. Where he says again, rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord. And, and it's important. I mean, you don't really see it here. But all of these things are actually imperatives. These are commands that Paul is giving to the church. And the reason I pull this verse up is I think we actually get a hint of how he was able to do this and how we might be able to be somebody that rejoices always as well. And it's in that statement, the Lord is at hand. 
We see it throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians. You see it throughout this passage as well that Paul was someone who lived his life with recognition that the Lord was at hand. And there's two parts to this. The first is that the Lord was at hand just spatially, that he walked through his life knowing that God was near. He was working. He was doing things in those people that we come across in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, that God was ahead of him working, that God is always near. But I think, too, the second part, and, and this is something that we've talked about a little bit in our series this, uh, so far, is this the second part, that the Lord is at hand, and that would be in that he's coming again. The second coming of Jesus, that he lived in light of what was coming, and he knew it was coming. That was something always on his mind, and something he always charged the people to have on their mind. And, and I, I mean, this week, I don't know what your week was like, but on Wednesday or Thursday, after like those two days that were just gloomy and rainy and dark. I feel like it began to kind of shape my outlook and thought and feeling of life. I began to feel gloomy and grumpy and dark. And I remember calling Claire and being like, gosh, I'm just ready for some good weather. And Claire, of course, hadn't looked at the weather report for the week ahead, very on top of it, said, well, don't worry, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's going to be beautiful, like no cloud in the sky, sunny and warm. There's just something about knowing that, that that was coming the next day was like not a cloud in the sky. Maybe I'll even get to go play golf. Who knows? But it's going to be beautiful. And, and there's something that really does do to you in the midst of the present gloomy and, and weather that is poor and dark. And see, what, what Paul lived by was this reality of knowing that no matter what circumstances in and around our life that that Jesus was going to return, he was going to make all things new, that he lived by that. It propelled him and motivated and shaped the way that he lived amongst his present circumstances. It's how he was able to rejoice always. Um, there's this video I've seen before on YouTube. I, I wish I could show it, but I would encourage you to search for it um, if you know how to navigate YouTube in the room. Pretty easy. But there, there's this one uh, of a dad giving his child who's colorblind glasses. It's an unbelievable video. And it's this boy who's been colorblind his whole life, and there's these glasses that have been made, and as you put them on, that you can see colors the way that they're actually meant to be seen. And it's just this touching moment of this dad and the, the wife's sniffling in the camera, like recording it, and, you know, he gives his son these glasses and said, hey, son, put your glasses on. And he puts them on, and it's like, oh, he might be seven or eight years old, and he is just like gripped with emotion for the first time being able to put on these glasses and see things the way he's never been able to see them before. And you could tell the dad is moved. The mom is, like I said, kind of like a mess behind the camera, how I assume that she's the one filming it. And for a moment, he's so overwhelmed, he takes his glasses off and he hugs his dad and they're having this moment and the dad just keeps having to tell him, like, son, put your glasses back on. And I can't get that image and that picture out of my head because so often the way that we struggle in our circumstances, the way that we walk through it without joy, without hope, without perspective is that we so often as followers of Jesus do not and we forget to put the glasses we have on offered to us. That instead we allow situations and circumstances to dictate our perspective on things. And that for the follower of Jesus, you have such a power and a gift to be able to walk through those things differently. And not just for yourself, but actually to make a greater witness to those around you as you do so. This opportunity to rejoice always comes as we put on those glasses. And it's, it's natural that if you see it, the, the, the next step here, like to be able to take hold of that, you can know what you can do. Like you know the glasses are available, but you might not know how to really press that into present realities when you really are struggling. And that's why tightly connected here is this next one where he says, pray without ceasing. Like pray and don't stop praying. Be somebody who there's never an end point to when you pray. And you might hear that, and I definitely did as a teenager, and honestly, I had a friend who, it was almost like this joke, like, pray without ceasing, don't stop. You know, we might think about it like we've just always got to get on our knees, we've always got to be reciting prayers in this formal matter. I love what one uh, commentator said on this. He says this, it is not in the moving of lips, but in the elevation of the heart to God that is the essence of prayer. Thus, amidst the commonest of duties and recreations of life, it is still possible to be engaged in prayer. 
You see, it's kind of this living and breathing kind of the reality that you recognize that all of your life is lived before God. He's present, he's involved, he's available, that we can walk through everything, the most tedious of tasks, beginning and still staying in that presence of God, inviting him into moments, inviting him into meetings. I mean, I think when you live in that, and I just know from my own life, those moments where I've, I've chosen to segment, you know, maybe you've fallen behind in your devotions to God. Maybe you haven't prayed by yourself in a long time, so you come into a group setting, and there's prayer, and that's the one moment. And instead of actually being able to press in on that, you feel guilty because you haven't been privately praying. Right? We begin to segment off. And what God is continually trying to draw us back into is to this life of fullness that he offers to you. To come back in, there's grace. Be drawn back in. I want to walk with you through life. If you recognize like the whole of scripture in Genesis 3, what happens is God's people sin and they're separated. They segment. They turn around. They go a different direction. And what happens? God goes towards them. That they are people and we are people that have been created by God and for God. We are fully dependent on God for everything. Whether you recognize it or not, it is the truth. And what God wants us to do is to recognize and to love it and to live in it and to be a people who are always praying, always communicating, always in the presence of God. As you head to your lunch, whether it's with a coworker or a very serious, important meeting, that it's just little things like, God, be present with us. I pray for my friend here as we enter into this lunch. Would you bless this conversation? It's as you walk throughout your day, as you walk back into the household, it might be like it was for Emily this morning, as you walk into church this morning, God, I don't even know where I am. My kids are crazy. (laughs) But it's this present of coming back to recognizing that God is available and wants us to live in that without ceasingness. And maybe this is a little bit of a, a helpful kind of handlebars for you. Again, this is from John Stock, clearly someone that I like and has shaped me. Uh, This is from a book he wrote on Christian basics, but he kind of talks about just five different types of prayer. And I like it because it's all this, you know, directional things, but I I think this is helpful. He says there's five ways that you can really press in and, and lay into being someone that prays more and lives in that season. He says, there's one, look up to God. You know, this is worship, this is adoration, this is recognition of who God is. Turn from looking at ourselves and our problems to God, the maker of heaven and earth. This is how we get perspective. God, this feels like a mountain and everything is ruined for me. And you begin to take a step up to God and realize, oh yeah, you're the maker of heaven and earth. That you are going to continue to sustain everything. That You get away from it and you see it for what it really is. You look up to God in prayer. Look in at ourselves. And what this should lead to is not necessarily that, man, I'm awesome, I'm killing it, but actually confession. God, this is the healthy discipline of reviewing our day, maybe at the end of the day, and calling to mind the ways that we failed, that we did not love God and love others as the way he's called us to. But it keeps us humble because we realize there is grace, there is renewal for those that confess their sins. Look around at others. This is kind of what I talked about as you head to lunch or whatever you might do, that as you come across issues and hear of things going on, it's a way to intercede for others. Look back to the past. Again, at the end of the day, you might look back and just see more of God's mercies throughout your day. So many of us move through our days. We don't reflect. We don't see all of God's little things throughout our days. This is a chance for us uh, to give thanks to God. And finally, the last one, look to the future. Uh, petition, supplication, God knows our needs before we ever say them, and he longs to answer them. But sometimes that last one of, you know, knowing maybe you believe, maybe you're very reformed, you believe God is sovereign, he knows my needs, he's in control, so why really pray? I've had this conversation with with somebody in here before in this congregation. I've loved the way that God has kind of led him through wrestling with that. Uh, I'll I'll say how John Calvin says, I think it's better, but he said, believers do not pray with a view of informing God about things unknown to him or of exciting him to do his duty or of urging him as though he were reluctant. On the contrary, they pray in order that they may arouse themselves to seek him, that they may exercise their faith in meditating on his promises, that they may relieve themselves from their anxieties by pouring them into his bosom. 
in a word that they may declare that from him alone they hope and expect, both for themselves and for others, all good things. So what we do when we begin to petition God and pray for things is we don't bend his will. We don't get his attention as if he's not there. But we actually begin to align our wills to his as we live and recite and live on these things. Let me just give you two invitations and then we'll move on to this last point. But uh, I think the Lent season, we're going to start a new series next Sunday, kind of teeing up. And then Ash Wednesday is the following Sunday. Uh, We're going to have a service in here. But the Lent season, kind of this looking and preparing for Easter, the, the, the cross, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, that 40 days from that Wednesday, not including Sundays, leading up to Easter, it's a really, I think, helpful time. It might be a good time for you to jump back into some disciplines. I, I just want to mention two things. One is there's a book, uh, Claire and I, she's not here this morning, she's watching Crew, who's not 100%. There's a book called uh, 40 Days Circles. Put it up because I forgot the title. There we go. Draw the Circle. The 40-day pr- uh, prayer challenge. I promise I did it once. Um, but in all seriousness, this was something Claire and I did, I think, in our first, second year of marriage during that season, uh, preparing up to Easter. The church we were part of did it. This was so formative. It's not anything crazy profound, but it was this 40 days of really having someone guide you through prayers and praying for things specific. And I think just the rhythm of getting into uh, praying regularly and having somebody maybe prompt ways to pray. This is a really great resource. You might use this Lent season to be someone that can begin to walk and form and be formed in this praying. Uh, the second is, is always, I'll mention, we, we pray on Thursdays at noon over Zoom. Um, Judy's going to start, if more people don't jump on soon, she's going to start making sure before you leave, you are committed. Uh, I, I, I mean that seriously. Judy has been unbelievably devoted and wants, to, wants us to be a church that continues to pray corporately. And we do that on Thursday afternoons over Zoom. If you're not on our email list and you want to know that, uh, or you want to say you're not on an email list, as if you haven't got it, let me know. I'll get that email to you. We'd love to have you join us. Um, so rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Let me just finish here. This last one, give thanks in all circumstance. I think it's important that he doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. But in all circumstances, as we've talked about, for the person who's in Christ Jesus, they know and they believe what Romans 8 says. That for those whom God loves, that everything in your life, the good, the bad, the in-between, it is used for good. That it is used to shape and to mold and to make you more into the image and, and likeness of Jesus. That the person who really knows this believes that everything comes from God's sovereign hand. That they can give thanks even in the midst of difficult things. I want to throw up this quote because, you know, it's just good for us to be reminded. Um, I saw this this week. I, I absolutely love this. This is anti-Philippians 4, 6 through 7. In all seriousness, though, I'm like, how true is this? If you can't read that, let me read this. It says, but my heart tries to memorize anti-Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious about everything. Don't pray. Don't make requests. Don't thank God. Let the chaos of the world that surpasses all your understanding guard your hearts and minds in prisons of fear. And I agree, it is funny, but this is is reality. This is true. This is how many of us actually live and walk through our lives. We are so gripped by the anxieties and the fear, real things. But we live into this and not what God has offered us. Green pastures, abundant life that we are instead gripped and chained and shackled in this sort of way. And it is no wonder that oftentimes Christians can be grumpy people. When again, Paul says, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, to be someone that is joyful, that does not stop praying, that gives thanks in all circumstances. And this this, this calls for great, great submission regularly in your life. It's why, again, we come each week and we partake of the Lord's Supper, that we sing, that we're renewed and reminded of God's love and grace for us, because this is us. And God, again, wants to offer and call us back into being more like the people he longs for us to be. And and for me this week, as I just thought about this, as I thought about the, the people that God has called in this church, that if we begin to actually embrace and live into this, 
you, you may not be aware, Paul actually never in this letter gives a kind of evangelism game plan to the Thessalonians. What he, off, what he gives them is Jesus, and he says, be somebody that is changed in shape and looks more like Jesus. That as you live into these things, your life will be such a witness to who Jesus is. And that's not to say that we don't preach the gospel and tell people about Jesus and use our words. I'm not saying that, but often what people have been so wounded by is that what Christians preach and what they live are different things. And this starts with each one of us. In some ways, I think about it as like, if you've ever done an Ikea chair, I had to do one for this church a few weeks ago. If you mess up on the first instruction and then you put it all together, it's just a mess. And then I have to call Claire and ask for help, and then we all get frustrated, and it's not a good experience. But when you get that first piece right and everything falls into place, things function as they're supposed to function. And again, this, this is kind of like your, your pilot's checklist. The first three things you should do as you head out and fly the plane and do everything else you're aware of, that these are three things I think we're continually supposed to be reminded of as Christians, that as you wake up tomorrow, I am to be someone that finds joy and gladness in God. I am to be someone that invites and walks with God throughout all of my day, inviting him into everything I'm in. And I'm to be someone that gives thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Let us pray as we head to the table this morning. Father, I think that we often want to find a fast track. The easier route to greater intimacy with you, to greater effectiveness, maybe to greater reach those in our neighborhood as a church to draw people into this place. God, what you give us is not a fast track or an easy plan. You actually give us a person that we are called to love and to know and to chase and pursue, Jesus Christ who did not do the fast track, God, that he came and he took on flesh and that he became human in every way except without sin. God, as we approach Easter season, we're reminded of the cross, that Jesus went the suffering way to death, but he resurrected and he came to life and he offers life to anybody that would be in Christ Jesus this morning tomorrow, this week, the next day, there is hope. God, I pray that we would begin to be more of a community that reflects that hope in all of our doings, that we would be a people that rejoice always, that pray without ceasing, that give thanks in all circumstances, that that is a people that will change their workplace, their neighborhood, their community. God, help us to believe that, to live into that. We need your spirit. We need your help. And you know that. It's why you gave us